Welcome to the Toronto International Film Festival. My name is Peter Kaplowski. And this is a special presentation program, but the, you guys usually see me at midnight, and this is going to be midday madness right now. We're about to watch Wendell and Wild. Before we do, let's reflect on where we are and its history, its land. We are located on the treaty lands of the territories of the Mississaugas of the Credit and the traditional territory of the Anishinaabe, the Wendat, and the Haudenosaunee. We should be all so gosh darn grateful to be here and give thanks. I would like to thank our lead and major sponsors, Bell, RBC, Bulgari, and Visa for their continued support. And a sincere thank you to our lead sponsor, oh, this is repeating. Uh, thank you to our major spotter, sp supporters, the Government of Canada, the Government of Ontario, Telephone Canada, and the City of Toronto. This film is eligible for the People's Choice Award, so vote at tiff.net slash vote. And we would like to thank Netflix for providing us with this film. I am so excited. Uh, I have frequently described the midnight section of the festival as a gateway to the rest of the festival. It's very popular with young audiences. This film is, I think, great for young audiences and old alike. Genre fans will have a great time. Henry Selleck is one of the masters of stop motion animation. Uh, it has been too long since he has returned, his work and artistry has returned to the screen. So please keep it going for Mr. Henry Sell it! Hi everyone. Uh, couldn't be happier to be here. Uh, world premiere of our film, a, a long time project. Um, got it start quite a few years back and then I hooked up with Key and Peele, perhaps the greatest sketch comedians of all time. And um, I'm just going to introduce uh, some of my collaborators and cast now. They're just going to come out briefly. Um, Mr. Jordan Peele. <laughs> Keegan-Michael Key. Lyric Ross. Woo! <laughs> Ellen Goldsmith Vane. And Wynne Rosenfeld. Anyone care to address the crowd with anything? Yeah, yeah. yeah, this is, uh, a, 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 we're so proud of this film um, and uh, can't wait to talk after. Um, yeah, when we, we, we started talking about this film s seven years ago yeah. and uh, watching them uh, put this together has been a labor of love for myself and Monkey Paw. And uh, so anyway, we're very proud of it. And uh, Henry and his team of, of, of puppeteers are absolute geniuses, but you know that. Here we go. This is Wendell and Wilde. So turn off your phones and get ready to watch Wendell and Wilde. Please keep it going for our hell maiden of Wendell and Wilde, Lyric Ross. Followed by Keegan Michael Key, yeah. Jordan Peele, yeah. and Henry Selleck. Whatever you want. Thank you so much. So at the beginning of the intro, you said this has been a long, you know, long incubation project, uh, pro uh, process, getting this from the idea to the screen. What were those initial conversations? How did you, Jordan, and the cast, everyone come to work with Henry? I got my version, but let's hear, <laughs> let's hear Jordan's. Yeah, our versions are, uh, yeah, it's probably a Rashomon, a slightly different versions. Um, 
you know, Henry didn't know it when he reached out, but he's, you know, been a, chi- a, a, a hero of mine uh, since childhood. <clears throat> I remember uh, I, I was probably 13 years old, 12 or 13 years old, and my, my mother, who's in the audience tonight, had, uh, give a shout out, Cindy, I'm not going to embarrass her, but... Uh, Nightmare Before Christmas was about to come out, and my mother had the wherewithal. She knew this. She could tell it was going to be something special, so she bought me these figures even before it came out. I just remember this very clearly. And so, and then it, it came out, and of course, was this instant, this piece of instant nostalgia, you know, and and this uh, this connection to a a, a style and and. A, a craft of stop start a, a level of craft uh, I had never seen so this this our, our, our we met each other about seven years ago now and this was this was before get out this we were in the, still doing key and peel and he reached out with this project and said I've got this thing um, and you two you know he was inspired by the these, the Terry characters from key and peel you know the the Drax them clowns. Drax them clowns. Yeah. You know? He said, "I want you know if I had this idea of making these demon characters, and he had this wonderful sort of dark fairy tale, or you know this grounded th- uh, story that he wanted to tell, and we hit it off. It was very hard for me to keep my cool. Very hard for me to keep my cool. And at some point, you said you had recently realized that." that you had gone into your ancestry, realized you are an octoroon, and I said, let's go. <laughs> I said, we're making it. Um, <laughs> true story. No, but it, it was, um, the, the notion of getting to work with Henry uh, is just a, is a lifelong dream come true. Um, and that, that's how it was for me, and so we, it was, just, it was just a yes, 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 all the way from the beginning. Lyric, how did you come to be a part of the project? Um... So from what I remember, this was about. <laughs> it's half a lifetime. Ago. Yeah. So when did? Yeah. When did? How far back did you record the? I want to say we started maybe four years ago. Wow. Yeah. 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 Um, I know I auditioned for it um, when I was still living in Chicago, and um, oh, we got Chicago people in here. <laughs> um, <laughs> But yes, and then I, um, shortly after that, I moved to LA, um, and that is actually when I met Henry, um, and we had a conversation about this whole project, and um, I mean, I had to say yes, and um, that's when we, we started the whole thing. We, um, I want to say we were in the studio, like we actually... We're doing things in the studio for about two years and then the pandemic hit and we had to move things over to the apartment. Um, and me and Henry were just talking about this, how um, my mom really hooked the closet up to um, make it a professional studio booth. <laughs> but yeah, it was, it was a fun journey, a great experience. And oftentimes, yeah, the, the voices are, are, you know, you're recording the voices often at the beginning of the process. And so did you, ha- did you get a sense, was there like a statue of the character? Did you get to see the character designs in advance uh, of the perfor- doing the performance lyric? I actually got to see the design of the character. I want to say the first day mm. I went into the studio and I was in awe. <laughs> I was like, oh my God, that's me. <laughs> <laughs> it was crazy. Yeah, and Lyric contributed so much to who Kat is. You know, we, we had an idea and you write lines, but she sort of got in tune with the character, her, the essence of Kat. And by the second uh, recording uh, session we had, she was telling me Kat wouldn't say that. Mm. She, she knew the character better than I, and that's what you hope for. And, um, you know, it's an incredibly critical character. And, and I listened to a whole lot of people. Finding Lyric was like the oxygen we needed to start making the film. Was there a lot of improvisation in, in those recording sessions? Uh, Jordan, Keegan, were... were 
what, what, what was those recording sessions like? Were you, did you ha because were those recording sessions during the pandemic? Were you, were you able to uh, work together? <laughs> did we, I mean, it is so spread out. It is, it is, yeah, it is so uh, epic, the amount of time <laughs> it took to make this project. In the beginning, we recorded together often, as often as we possibly could. And having us in a booth together, especially after like a long amount of time, for Henry, it must be kind of akin to having like 30 squirrels in the booth. <laughs> That there's, and yeah. there's script there, yes. Squ the squirrels, squirrels that bite. Go, squirrels gone do. Squirrels that, squirrels that bite, right, right, right. And, and wrestle. But I, I, there, something that I always remembered, uh, Henry, a visual was always seeing you sit, he would sit on a stool in the corner about 10 feet away from us and we would just be talking to each other back and forth and improvising and it was as if you were conducting or listening to music. He would often, he would just look like this and he would go... Oh, 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 no, stop there, stop there. That's a good direction. Let's keep, no, oh, what? Oh, I was really, I, I loved watching you because you would just, you did, like, there we go, oh yeah, 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 that's good. That's good. What, did, what did you just say? What did you just say, Jordan? And so we would just riff and riff yeah. and riff. And then if something's not good, his hand goes up here and he's like, oh he goes, my. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and you go, okay, that's not good. And yeah, we're, we're like, no, no. And he's, the, and he's like, no, just scratching, just scratching, just scratching. Yeah. Um, that was good. But. No, we got, we've had four comedy albums worth of outtakes because <laughs> you're not going to stop when these two start to perform and they're getting, they're getting in tune again. They hadn't worked together in a while. They're getting in tune and you're just in awe of how far they can riff on something. Just like a single word, the meaning of a single word no, it means this. No, it means this to me. And uh, were there ever any moments where they would go off on, on a riff that you then realized, oh no, now we have to animate this because I don't want. I, I want to keep this. I want to keep this in the movie. No, it's never like that. It's 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 more like they had to go off yeah. to find those characters, mm -hmm. and there's lots and lots of pieces they just came up with and tones they came up with. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't have come up with them. They needed that freedom, and then you pluck and pick and use surgery to get the good things in there. With, uh, with respect to the script, um, I, one thing that really struck me about the film is some of the themes of you know, activism within one's community and the idea that we, you know, it is possible to change communities um, and, change, and break those cycles. I'd like, I'd like to just hear from the team just sort of about how that was very important to the story. How about I go last? I'd, lo I'd love to hear your... <laughs> Well, you know, the, the, I think the, the story in many ways is, you know, obviously it's about Kat, and it's about this idea that you can, um, that you can conquer and work with your demons. Um, and, you know, Henry has this ability to craft a, a story that is of just a unique tone. Right, a tone you don't see anywhere. It's it's a tone. It's it's genuinely scary, and at the same time, it's it's got the the whimsical. It's got the whimsy of a fairy tale, as I said before. Um, you know the 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 ideas of of putting the you know nods to the the prison industrial complex. Yeah, yeah. You know, so to heavy speak. material. Heavy stuff <laughs> yeah. for kids. Uh, fairy tale. Fairy tale. Yeah. But that you know, doesn't mean it doesn't but fairy belong. Tale, yeah, and fairy tales, you know, in, in, originally, they were always heavy stuff. <laughs> right, there, well, there's a, there, there's a cautionary tale there. And so, yeah, I, I think that there is a connection to the character cat and to the, the sort of exercising of the demons of the city. Um, as well, that's just really beautiful, and uh, you know, I, I particularly I just love the sequence of Cat's uh, metamorphosis. I think is so, so uh, her breaking the chains and, and working with her th this representation of her demon. I think it's such a beautiful metaphor, and I I just. I love this type of content because, like I said, I think whoever you are, who whatever age you are, you are picking things up, and you're picking things up in common with one another, and that's just a very special type of movie, and, and, and I'm uh, really proud to be a part of it. Henry, did you want to add to that? Oh, I want to uh, give a shout out to my wife, Heather, who's here, because... She's had, she's had several careers uh, in addition to raising our two demons, our two sons. Um, 
including uh, 10 years as a special needs advocate for kids in trouble, uh, going all the way from kids on the spectrum to kids about to be put into the uh, school to prison pipeline. And I learned so much about, you know, these uh, no strike uh, policies where kids are pushed right out for the slightest infraction. And she saved a lot of kids. She, she got in there and protected them and kept them in school. And through that, I, I just, it just became like, well, who would the worst villains be? And it was never going to be the demons. It was never going to be Buffalo Belzer. It's always got to be people. Mm -hmm. And it just, it just worked it, its way in there. So it's, it's, it's not that the whole story is about that, but it's uh, something real that I thought was a good anchor. One of my favorite scenes is just when the progressive members of the community are stymied by the fact that literal conservative zombies have <laughs> wandered in and they're like, well, it's in the rule book, they can vote. <laughs> was, there, was there a particular moment that, you know, that when that idea came to mind in the, in the writing of the process that that had to happen? Oh, it evolved. You know, you, 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 you fine tune it. We had, a, we had a little extra time to tune everything. <laughs> you know, it's, you know, watching Henry's career and he's made these iconic films and you know, we had conversations about, you know, the, the journeys of these films and, uh, you know, the, the, the limitations and, 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 and you know, and, and these things. And, you know, there's something about, uh, you know, this idea that you can make something animated, you can make something wondrous and have it be unnerving to, have it be really scary. Things really challenging. And it feels like... I feel like the, the world is really educated to who Henry Selleck is and who he is as an artist. And this is an extension of that. And I truly believe that horror is not just something for adults. And if this is a, a world and we live in a country where we, you know, we, we're, we're training kids to run at shooters. And it, it feels very much to me like you know, they're old, they're old enough and mature enough to talk about and see stories about really big, important, dark things. Yeah, it, it, protecting kids too much is a, is a huge disservice. That's the original fairy tales were about, yeah, there's, there's witches, there's monsters that will eat you, and you need to know that. And it was meant for, for kids. It was, it was warnings and meant to be entertaining. Um, but, you know... A, a good scare is uh, something I always strive for, and uh, not a good scar. We're going to be going to the audience after one more question. Lyric, I just wanted to ask, had you had the opportunity to see the film before today, like completed? I have. Okay. Yeah. Well, when, you, when you first watched it for the first time, was there anything that surprised you uh, that you weren't, you weren't expecting? Just because, again, like, this has been such a long process, and at the beginning, you know, not, nothing is animated yet. You're just seeing sort of designs. Um, personally, I thought I sounded very cool. <laughs> <laughs> I agree. True. <laughs> so cool. <laughs> I'm going to step out of the light. We have time for one or two questions. Uh, right there. Yes. What is it about horror in film that, I mean, horror, the horror genre in general that Jordan is attracted to? You know, I feel like in a lot of, I feel like it's the best genre in a lot of ways because it's the most inclusive. Reality has horror in it. Any film that doesn't is bullshit, you know? <laughs> um, and that's kind of how I feel. And I feel like if you include horror in a film, then, you know, that's kind of what it becomes. And that's why I just, I feel like it's, a massively important genre. And it comes with all the other things as well. You know, it comes with the comedy. It, it, it comes with the, the, the love of life in it. So I, that's why. It's like I can't get away from it. <laughs> we, we can't get away from horror. So it's, you know, I, in, in many ways, I'm, I'm, I'm just reflecting. And another thing I wanted to... Yeah, okay. okay. I'm, done. No. I'm done. <laughs> 
There we go. Oh, there's a, a waving hand that was right there. Yes. Thank you. How do you do it? How do you write horror and comedy simultaneously? Well, I, I think the biggest thing is, some of it is, not the biggest, but some of it is looking for the unexpected. The unexpected is what's common between the two genres. That you, when, when you think, I mean, we say when people talk about jokes, people go, oh, we, th we thought they were going to zig and then they were going to zag. That's the anatomy of a joke, right? Is that the setup thinks you go, you're going to go in one direction and we go in an opposite direction. And, and horror has a, a very similar anatomy. They share a lot of DNA. Mm -hmm. And um, so when you write, think about, you know, what would the unexpected be? And sometimes I think when people are writing in their own voice, the unexpected is because your, your experience of life is so specific, so you can go, oh, I'm going to go in that direction. Uh, everybody will know. No, not everybody will know because you're you and they're them. And so I would, that's a, something I would say about writing. Right? That's right. Right, and, right from your prism. And what we would always do uh, on, on Key and Peele is start with, this, start with the absurd. Start with the crazy notion. Start with the pulp movie premise or whatever it is. And then try as hard as you can to ground it. To ground it, yeah. And then in the process of grounding it, whether it's comedy, you, you get the laughs in grounding it and bringing it to reality. And the horror, making it feel real, is the, is the key. Right. The, sto the, the, the other thing is you, you start where Jordan said, but then when you start writing the scene, you start at a one. One of normalcy. You go one, 16, 28, 43, 506. Don't start the scene at 506. Yeah. The idea starts at 506. The scene starts at a one in reality. And then everybody can get on board. Yeah. There's a, a hand uh, over there. Uh, oh, you're not anymore? Okay, right there then. Just for the people, the, the benefit of the people in the balcony, the question is regarding the design of the characters uh, and how that was developed in collaboration with the team and specifically keeping the, um, the separation of the faces, uh, the, the lines on the faces. There's a degree of an artifice that's exposed there. Yeah, early on, I always um, focus on characters first and um, it took a little while to convince Key and Peel that they should be caricatured. Uh, I'm really happy went along with it, um, <clears throat> but started with, you know, I, I did a few, I always do a few bad sketches, and then that challenges the good artists to do something better, and I reached out to the, I think, the most artistic and best caricaturist in the world, Pablo Lobato from Argentina, and um, he, yeah, he's um, marvelous, marvelous. All, he did all the character designs for the film, and he helped us pitch the film. He did free work up front just to be a part of it, he was so excited about. So, um, as far as the, the look, and his stuff is very Picasso-esque, and it turned out he actually can draw dimensionally as well, uh, but we sort of held on to that very graphic look in the underworld for the demons. Um, the whole idea of the upper and lower faces, I've been involved in this stop motion animation for, for decades now, and there is a long tradition of replacement animation in, in, in this um, where we had to hand sculpt all these different expressions and then you would change the entire head like Jack Skellington it's like a, it's a, a row of ping pong balls with different eyes and mouths and we, you know we worked very carefully to, to do it but um, on Coraline uh, I discovered along with this guy Mike Cachuela and Martin Meunier that if we split the faces, then we could like multiply the uh, uh, range of expressions for any given character. And um, funny thing is, we, so we went from hand sculpting everything to at least drawing them in 2D because I don't like to work from the computer out. I always want to have a handmade thing to start with. 
but went into the computer, spit it out. Um, even on Coraline, we had a, a seam line between upper and lower phase. I really wanted to keep it, and most people agreed, but the money people were too frightened. <laughs> you know, they, they're going to be, it's like, it's imperfect. It, it shows it's not real. Um, in, this, in this time, I've always known that for most people, most people in the audience, in five minutes, they're not really thinking about it anymore. And they're invested in the, in the, in the characters. But <clears throat> if you're going to do stop motion, you have to accept that it's not perfect, that there's always going to be bumps and things that can't be perfected in the way you can in CG, but it also is an actual performance through the puppet uh, by an animator um, reacting to the, the vocal work that's been done. And um, I like to remind the audience, yeah, this stuff was made, that seam line's part of it. Terrific, well please put your hands together for Wendell and Wilde. Remember to vote for the film, tip.net slash vote. Take a bow. Thank you so much. This means so much to us. Thank you very much for uh, the reaction. Thank you, Tim. Thank you. Thank you.